Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. On today's show, I have Vianney from Bleece Plugins. And right now, right now, from July 9th through July 19th, 2021, Bleece is offering their Delay plugin for free for members of the Music Production Club. Bleece Delay is a multi-purpose delay echo frequency shifter with a lot of really cool features, very easy to use in your DAW. It's got sync delay, ping pong delay, unsync delay. It's a really cool frequency shifter. There's lots of modulation with LFOs on the filters and the delay times. And the feedback on this delay goes well above 100%, which means you can get some really crazy feedback noises and create risers and swooshes and all kinds of madness in your music. It's a great delay for your typical delay applications on vocals or instruments but it's also a lot of fun for sound design and that's actually where i think it shines so that's free if you are part of the music production club from july 9th through july 19th the music production club is my subscription service that gets you all kinds of goodies in your inbox and helps support my work you get new ableton live packs you get video courses sample packs i've got my what bob ross teaches us about music production book there's all kinds of stuff in there and it's always changing and it's the best way to keep up with my work. It gets you inside our live classes on Zoom where we can talk about whatever you want and go over certain topics that we've got and sometimes special guests. You get in the Discord, you get the access to the samples folder, and there's even more discounts and free stuff from other companies in the internet. That's the Music Production Club at brianfunk.com slash MPC. And make sure you go check out Bleece plugins. That's B-L-E-A-S-S dot com and enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Vianney from Bleas Plugins. And Vianney's going to talk to us today about their new work. They've got a lot of stuff for iOS on your iPad, your iPhone, and they are also bringing that stuff over to the desktop. And I've been really enjoying the ports of these plugins um, specifically the ones I'm having a lot of fun with are the shimmer. It's a shimmer reverb where the sounds pitch up. Um, the granulizer, which is I think that one of the newest ones. And also, and also slow machine, which is one of those effects uh, where you're pitching things down, up, and you can do it rhythmically. It's a really cool take on like the tape stop thing. There's a lot to talk about, a lot of cool stuff. Um, and Additionally, I'm extremely happy to say that Bleece is going to be offering members of the Music Production Club their delay plugin for free uh, for, I think it's going to be about a week to 10 days F, uh, from the time this podcast airs to the time uh, the offer is good. So if you join the Music Production Club, you will get that. Um, and I hope that it opens up a world of new plugins for you as you dive into the various offerings they have. And let's say hello to Vianney. Welcome to the show, sir. Yeah, hello, Brian. Uh, thank you very much for, for your invitation. I'm very happy to, to be here. Yeah, thank you, too. I've really been enjoying the stuff. It's been great to get to talk to you over email a little bit about the company and the work. And um, just it's really cool to see you guys um, expand, you know, um, I would say you guys are a relatively new company starting out on the iOS and now it's blossoming into plugins on our desktops and um, it's just a really, I'm really welcoming the new sound palette you guys are offering. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, at least uh, we've started it in uh, 2017. It was just a project and then we've started the company in 2018. Uh, and we've we started with releasing a iPhone slash iPad Groovebox app. It's a very straightforward app where you can do like everything. You've got just four tracks, a drum machine, a mono synth, and chords as well. And um, we started with that on the iPad, and then we expanded to make more plugins. The Bliss Delay, for instance, uh, was one of our first plugins we wanted to make because it has a frequency shifter. You can you can put your feedback, uh, you know, above hundred percent and all that stuff. And since then, we've released like sixteen apps for iOS, 
And um, at that day, six of these apps have been ported to desktop and more and more apps. Uh, so plugin, you know, effect plugins, but uh, uh, synthesizers as well will be released uh, in the year 2021 and 2022. Hmm. Oh, that's very cool. You know, w- you know, one of the things I love about, um, I use Ableton Live um, and I always appreciated that there's this uniformity to all the devices. Like they have a look, a knob on the the um, beat repeat looks like a knob on EQ8, and everything has this like together look. And in other DAWs I've used, um, sometimes every time you open a new plugin, it's like a whole new spaceship you have to learn how to navigate. There's all these different looks for the knobs or the faders or these graphics, which I mean sometimes are really beautiful and fun to look at and can be immersive themselves, but um, as far as like practical usage, I find it takes a little bit longer to get used to it. So I always mm. loved live for that, especially as I was learning some of this stuff myself. And I think Blease is doing a really nice job with that too. You guys have like a look, you know, to your devices. And it seems to me that it, it is very um, touch screen friendly, you know, because sometimes when we use apps on the iPad or the iPhone and they're meant to be like hardware emulations, it's kind of awkward like moving a fader or turning a knob in this way. But I think you guys have done a really nice job in making it intuitive for the touch screen interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Indeed, uh, you've got an eye for this because um, so the fact that we've started to make apps firstly on iOS made us think to make it very clear, very intuitive. And uh, one of the things that made us start this company is that we felt that we could bring something because there are so many plugins that just try to emulate real hardware stuff. And in my opinion, it's a bit dumb because in the end, either you use a touch screen or a keyboard and mouse and this that just doesn't fit. I, I, I'm well aware that uh, many emulations are here to recreate already, you know, expensive hardware stuff and make them affordable on VST. But we wanted to have a different approach on the design side, you know, the UI side, the interface to make it more clear, uh, you know, uh, easier to, to work with, especially for touch screens. So we've got plenty of sliders. For instance, the iOS version of the granulizer, you can put your finger within the visualizer and tweak the parameters this way. So mm-hmm. great, you know, when you are uh, ambient stuff. So this is the first reason we want t- to, to make it very intuitive. But also there is, you know, CPU load, CPU load. Um, and when you have apps with plenty of spectrums and beautiful visualizations, Okay, it looks good, but the issue is that you spend many DSP and CPU on the design thing, and it's a bit, you know, not handy when you are working with the sound and you want to prioritize the sound. So we try to make our apps very optimized, very, you know, uh, work on the C++ uh, side of the DSP processing to make those apps very CPU effective you know, uh, easy to load uh, and uh, not crashing mm. <laughs> also. <laughs> How long does it take to take the idea to say like release date? Is this, has this gotten easier or um, what is that process like? For, like here you are, you have the idea. How long does it take? I'm just curious um, in, in your cases. Yeah, yeah. So firstly, we talk about it. So uh, sometimes, so we are a three people company. Uh, I am not the dev. I work with Alexi and William, who are the Bliss developers. And sometimes on a Monday, uh, we come to the office and say, I've got an idea. Uh, and what if we did? And then we start talking about it, um, about the vision. And once we've decided to go on a new product, then uh, one of the devs will start to do a prototype to, you know, 
try to make a prototype that fits this vision. And then uh, just internally, we share the plugin, we play with it and we say, okay, what can we improve? And at a certain stage, we say, okay, we've done enough. The, the prototype is more than a prototype. It could be a, fi a final product, but then starts the beta testing, uh, you know, part of it. So we've got plenty of musicians uh, we are happy to work with and we send them the, the beta of the plugin. And then we get inspired from their feedback because mm -hmm. they, they see something that we don't. And ultimately, once the, pro the product is finished, uh, then we work on the release, so making videos, making a great looking logo as well, you know, a picture for the app, which I think is also important, especially on iOS, but also mm -hmm. true for desktop. And eventually we release it. So it depends. It can be quite quick if we do a simple plugin effect, very straightforward. Like for instance, the flanger uh, we've made, uh, we wanted to do a rhythmical flanger, you know, be able to uh, make it rhythmic rather than random or just, mm. you know, once we had the ID uh, finished, it went, it went quite fast. But on the contrary, when we work on synthesizers, it's a bit longer, definitely mm. longer work. Yeah, oh yeah, I can imagine that because now you're, you know, synthesizers are generating the sound and then they're also affecting it in, in many different ways. There's a lot more mm -hmm. to think about. Absolutely. Yeah. That's fun. So um, you guys started with the groove box. Yeah, yeah, the groove box is uh, one of our first visions. And uh, what I like very much about the groove box is that it goes to the essential. You've got only four tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's great on iPhone for sketching, for instance. We need good chords, a good bass line, a good beat. And each track has its own swing. You can also adjust the swing for each track, which is very important. And then once you've done your sketch, you can be, do a bit of sound design, tweak your samples, and eventually use it as a controller with MIDI in, MIDI out, and uh, uh, you know use it to control other synthesizers and make it the center of a, a bigger project if you want to finish the song. But for sketching and for intuition uh, and inspiration, mm -hmm. It's a great tool, it's a great instrument, and it was our very, very first app. It was a long app to do. Um, and after that, we, after that, we started to do like uh, um, smaller projects first, first, because we thought that maybe when you do a big, big instrument, big dough, it's almost dough, well, it's a groove box. You've, you have to be known first. And uh, mm. it's a bit tricky to do a big uh, instrument like this and from scratch. Um, so, and, and I still use the Groovebox very much, uh, very, very often. I like it very much because it's another way to do music. Mm -hmm. It's an another approach, which is way simpler than, way simpler than Ableton, even though Ableton is very, very simple. So, and we like Ableton very much as well. Yeah, well, I think there's something to be said for that because um, a, a program on DAW like Ableton or Logic or whatever anyone's using, even GarageBand, there are so many layers to it. Uh, there's so much to learn. I mean, you, you're always learning. I, I've been using Live for well over a decade and you know, uh, there's still things where I go, oh, wow, look at that, you know, <laughs> like, mm. and yeah, it's very deep, but this, that's, that is uh, the issue, especially when you are concentrating on the creation, you can sometimes get lost into uh, the very big deepness, you tend to use more effects, you tend to get lost in your sound design, whereas a good song is just a good beat, a good bass line, good chords and arrangements and uh, chord inversions or whatever. And it's good to be focusing on that firstly, because mm. you tend to get lost in your dough, except perhaps for garage bomb, because it's quite, uh, it's less deep than uh, logic is, but uh, well, 
Maybe I'm wrong. Well, it's gotten deeper and deeper and deeper over the years. But that's, yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I'm getting at is you can get kind of lost in the, you know, the world of your DAW. There's, you can do almost everything in it. So it's easy to get lost. And sometimes you just need a little focus. You know, I, I mean, I know I find this happens to me all the time. I'm, I'm working, I'm deciding to make a track and I've got a beat and I find myself like tweaking the snare drum for 45 minutes. And it's like, well, I don't even know what this song is yet. I have a, just a beat and here I am, I'm lost in the, you know, I got off the highway and now I'm on, on the scenic route here where I should really be focusing on that. And I think having limitations is so important. So I, when I'm looking at Groovebox, I can see that it's like, let's focus on the things we need to get going now. And I think that's a real clever limitation whether you're using it in Groovebox or whether you even do that for yourself inside your DAW to just stop yourself from getting lost in all the little minute details you can get into before you really have any business being there. Mm, mm, absolutely. Yeah. Sound design can go maybe in a second step. But uh, I know that sometimes you get only get inspired once you've got good sound, you know, a good synth sound, and yeah. it, sometimes it, it sparkles something of inspiration that you want to follow then. So sound design is also a great part, but yeah, yeah. Let's focus on the, on the groove first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens to me a lot. I, I do a lot of sound design, making my Ableton Live packs and all, and I will often do that kind of work when I'm not in the mood to make music. You know, so I you know I want to do work, but like, all right, maybe I'm not feeling creative right now. So I tend to do that. I try to like batch it off. But as you said, very often in that process, I'm making a sound. I'm like, oh, and then I want to go, and that inspirational wave hits me. You know, through the sound. So I mm. think it when that happens, you know, you have to really jump on that because it's it's precious yeah. and it does fade away. And I think yeah, this yeah, is a great, catch. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So like, this is what you have is just a really nice way to focus on just that and staying in that inspirational phrase and f stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Absolutely, it's a train you've got to catch. And being creative <laughs> is not like a sport. It's not something you can do. Oh well, you need discipline. You have to repeat uh, and all, but. Sometimes you just don't feel it. And yeah. sometimes you do at like an hour that is completely, uh, you know, out of range, but you have to jump on it. It's very precious moments indeed. Mm. Well, I imagine that's probably pretty similar in the development side and with what you guys are doing when you're coming up with your ideas. Because if, if, I'm sure there's many different stages of the process. And some, some maybe you may be more in the mood for it other times than others. And when you're feeling one thing, does do you see any kind of connection with that, with music making, with um, creativity and the, the, that part of the work? Well, we are all musicians uh, in Bliss, so we can see that parallel, as, as you say. Uh, I would say that uh, development has a creative side, definitely, especially in the prototyping stage. But once you've released your app and you have to do like updates or correct bugs, it's, le it's less fun, definitely. It's less fun. It's not the job that, um, you know, creative people like the most, but it needs to be done, especially. So, yeah, uh, there, are, there are a few parallels that can be done because at the first stage, you get excited uh, and inspired and uh, you have all that stuff that you can put together and some in, at some time make something new. So it's a creative process. It's wonderful. But always in like everything in life, especially in music making, you reach a stage where you have to build things up to make it more stable and all. And here comes the work. Just like in uh, your last uh, video on YouTube where you, you talk about, you know, the, um, making your bass sound better and eventually you need to edit and do like the hard work 
a painful kind of painful for work. But in the end, it's because you want to have a clean and neat work mm. that is done and all. So there are lots of parallels to be done between music creation and plugin development. It's kind of the same thing in a way because you have to learn language, you have to get inspired, you have to keep motivated, you need discipline. Plenty of uh, parallels ca can be done. Mm. You know, that's something I was trying to get at in that particular video where I'm cleaning the bass. I'll put the link in the show notes, but um, basically we had a bass line and a drums and in between every note, my bass makes a lot of noise. It's got hum and rattle, electronic hum, and like it needs a setup. It needs a little love. Um, so uh, I wanted to show like that side of it a little bit. Like, yes, there are some things you can do that are a little more automatic. I started with a gate, then I even did a little volume automation that I could just copy and paste the curves, but it didn't quite get what I was looking for. <laughs> and I wanted to just show that sometimes you got to roll up your sleeves and just get in there every little space between every note and just clean it up. Mm -hmm. Because, um, uh, you know, I love watching like people make tracks and watch these videos and here's how I made this song. Here's how we recreated this track by whoever. And I think a lot of times that part of the job gets left out. So when people are making their music and they get there, they feel like, well, isn't there like a button I can press for this? Sometimes <laughs> there's no button. Sometimes, the, sometimes you are the button, and you gotta keep mm -hmm. doing it over and over. So I'm sure that happens um, in this process as well. Mm -hmm. and, but that is often the difference between, you know, average and great. That that takes you up to that next level. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I like very much the first stage where you, you've got to be creative, but you. The, the longer and the, um, you know the further you, you get into the project, the more the harder it is and also the more discipline you need to have in order to achieve. But once it's done and it's perfect, then you also have you know a lots of motivation in the end as, as well. Mm. So as a musician, what, what kind of music are you into? What are you making? What do you play? Well, what, what I do play is uh, currently I make mainly like techno music and electronic music when I have the time, you know, uh, aside from testing my own plugins and all, or okay. the Bliss plugins. Uh, recently, uh, yeah, I got into making more, uh, you know, very minimal te uh, techno music. This is the kind of stuff I do, but I have also made some. Uh, Electronica stuff, uh, but the, ideally, if I could, I, I would also make a blues album, mm. you know, blues music album as well, when I have time. So I, I started playing the piano when I was a kid. Then as a teenager, uh, uh, I got my big voice and then I got a guitar and all and, and listened to Jimi Hendrix and stuff. Cool, cool. And uh, now, that I, that I grew older, I, I tended to go towards electronic music. Mm -hmm. mm. Very nice. And does that inform the like types of plugins you guys develop, the types of devices and apps? Well, uh, all three of us are musicians, and we tend to do uh, music that is kind of electronic. Mm -hmm. So we are maybe also... Alexi, one of the developers, is also a guitar player. He uh, used to uh, play in a band called Chico Chico, uh, post-rock slash mass rock uh, rock band. So he will do lots of guitar. He's a guitar player first. And this is also why he would do such a delay. For instance, the Bliss delay is great for guitar. But uh, in the end, we are more maybe electronic music focused, I would say. So the Bliss plugins are a bit inspired or are, might be used more in non-acoustic stuff or might be, but I, I definitely might be wrong because I see plenty of guitar players using our apps, especially the shimmer or the delay, the mm -hmm. reverb as well. Uh, and uh, also I'm very, very happy to 
that the bliss can reach more hip hop producers, uh, especially with the slow machine uh, effect, because it's wonderful when you do like trap stuff and all, because you can make great breaks, uh, change your melodies um, in a way that sounds more like a hip hop vibe and all. Hmm. But so I wouldn't. I wouldn't limit uh, the possibilities of the Bliss plugins to my own musical vision. <laughs> mm. Well, that's interesting because I did sort of feel like when I was first looking at everything that you guys have, they kind of remind me of like the guitar pedals you would see like at the store. You got delay, chorus, flanger, you got, you know, phaser, reverb, and, and it covers a lot of those um, individual devices. Yeah, we call them the classics, for mm -hmm. instance. Uh, this is um, uh, things that must be done. So this is why we've made a chorus, a delay, a shimmer, reverb. We are going to release as well a phaser, a flanger, and a wonderful saturator as well. Um, and yes, we are very inspired, especially by guitar music, because we play the guitar as well. Uh, but the main difference with uh, guitar pedals we try, especially when we worked on the chorus, we've tried plenty of, you know, classic hardware guitar pedals. And we thought, okay, this, this classic chorus is, do sound very great on a guitar. But we have to think of a chorus that can go deeper and that mm -hmm. can go like almost experimental. So we al always try to go way, you know, have no limit about the possibilities you can do, even with a chorus, even with a reverb. This is why you've got like that, that, that stuff I said about the delay is a good example. You can go way beyond 100% feedback and not all guitar pedals can do this. You don't have also those filters and tweaks and all. But yeah, uh, it's a good uh, comparison to talk about uh, guitar pedals. Uh, we, will, uh, we will release more effects, classic effects as well, but we will also try to focus on more innovative sound effects as well. Hmm. I'm a big fan of any delay that will go past 100%. Um, in my <laughs> first experience doing that, I've, I have a boss... Uh, it's the white delay pedal. Uh, it's like DD3 uh -huh. or something like that. And um, it lets you do that. And I, yeah, it, there's a particular mode you can switch on where it will just go on and on forever. And I found that just to be like a world. Like you put anything into that and you start turning the knob and it starts feeding back and like these new tones come out. And then you t dial it back a little and you just have like all this control over these like waves and um, the worlds of rushing sounds coming in and out and it, they were I was using them as textures over like certain parts of my songs I would I guess I was sampling them really at that time I, I, like if I knew I had like a C chord I'd play something in there and let the delay go nuts and take that recording and put it right over the C and then you know repeat for different chords uh, it's, but it's so much fun and the way you guys have the delay set up where now you're filtering things and you're adding the um, the frequency shifting so it's moving and there's a lot of life to that. And I found the same thing with like the chorus especially too. There's a lot of, a lot of like extra stuff going on that you have control over that you don't always see. Mm -hmm, nice. mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. You can also make textures and it's not limited to a very, you know, uh, how could I say that uh, in English? Like, uh, not. It has to be like limitless or feel like limitless. Although, if you need to have a very specific spectrum of sound effects, then for that you've got the presets. But I, li I like that you can go way beyond the classic limitations of some cruises. But for the delay, yeah, we did stole a few ideas from that Bose pedal, for instance. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> uh, the delay g g going above 100%, yeah, yeah, it's not our idea. 
<laughs> yeah. Bus, bus that didn't see it. Yeah, and that's like a, a nice, um, you hear that a lot in like old reggae, um, probably with those big rolling uh, tape delays where they're, you know, pop, 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 and they get those like cool swells. Um, I think that's just such a fun sound that's so useful for a lot of things if you want to create like a feedback or some kind of like build in a song. Um, you can really have some chaotic fun. You know, just just be ready to move that volume knob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And uh, and lower the feedback and put some filter on just not to ruin your ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if I can ask you a question that maybe you might have a nice technical answer for me, because um, I I get asked this often uh, about the differences between flanger and phaser. Ah, <laughs> I myself had quite some issues to to definitely identify because they do sound quite close indeed. So basically, a flanger. So you will you will try to put one delay line just slightly. Um, uh, how, how can I say it? Slightly uh, not in phase with uh, the, um, the other line. So a slight, an offset in timing between two audio signals. So you, you split the audio signal and create that slight offset. And this is how you get that flanger effect. A flanger is basically just like a chorus or a delay in some way, but it goes way, 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 way faster. Mm. So fast that it creates that kind of stereo sound, if I may say. Stereo is not a, a phaser uh, on the other end uh, is made of notches, kind of a filter notch. A phaser can have one notch or up to like 24. In our phaser, we went up to 24, if I can remind it uh, clearly. And as a notch is a frequency notch on a specific frequency, and you will make it move to create some kind of special effect or filter effect. So basically a flanger is offset based, a phaser is filter based, if I, if I may say. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, it's interesting you do get, uh, they're kind of like related, you know, flanger, phaser, even chorus a little bit too. Um, mm -hmm. Similar ideas, but there is a nice, interesting sound to it. Um, I notice in the um, the the text about um, the phaser device, you mentioned um, some of the artists that use it, and uh, Tame Impala came up. And I, I, you know, when I listen, I love Tame Impala, and um, when I listen to his music. Um, a lot of times, like on the drums, you'll hear this, like on fills especially, like this phasing sound on mm. the voice. Uh, it's all over the place, and it's funny to me because it was a. I have a mm. Boss Phaser pedal actually, that uh, it's like a green one, that I never was able to get much use out of. Uh, you know, probably for the style of music I was playing, but um, it, it just was always so intense. You know, but. Um, these more like subtle things yeah. that can be used in like a more like psychedelic, like textural way are, are really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There is a great album that has been released uh, quite recently from uh, Gaspar Roger, a French, the French guy from the band uh, Justice, for instance. Mm -hmm. And he released his solo album uh, where, with plenty of drums and he would put a phaser effect on his drums. And I liked it very much. It makes it sound a bit vintage, if I may say. But just to make like subtle transitions into the music making. And a phaser is mostly used on pads and, uh, uh, you know, chords and all. But on a drum, mm. it's very, very interesting as well. But it's, you cannot put it like everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> But well, maybe Tame Impala might, but he seems to get away with it. <laughs> but you're right, on the drums, it's interesting because you've got these like little sh short bursts of sound. Because on a pad, um, you'll hear, you know, you hear the whole movement of it. But on the drums, you just go like, tsh, 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 
it's like a little more rhythmic in a, in a fun way. And uh, uh, symbols get washed out in- interestingly with that. It's a fun effect. Mm-hmm. I've, I've found a new love for it, you know, for maybe <laughs> a little bit of my youth kind of hating on that pedal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of psychedelic. This is why uh, the one we've made is very colorful. I talked earlier about, you know, the visual aspect of plugins. I think it's very, very important. And it has to look nice. It has to be a pleasure. But uh, you don't need to make complicated animations to get mm. a beautiful feeling. And uh, the phaser, the bliss phaser, I'm very proud of it because it's, it looks beautiful. It's mesmerizing. It's hypnotizing. And yeah. I like it very much. Uh, it has the comb. We are going it's almost, to... Uh, you see it on there, like I, I guess they're called comb filters, right? Like that's what we're doing when yeah, you comb filters, having, like, yeah, yeah, more than a few, and um, mm-hmm. it it is really cool to just see them, like see how they're interacting, and um, yeah, yeah, it helps you understand a little bit of what's going on in there. Absolutely, you can see where the frequency notches are. It's quite useful, but also you've got that kind of um, how can I say? It's almost as if you were in a um, helmet uh, when you are a biker, you know, you've got that visier we say in French. So it's got this broadened vision uh, looks. I like it very much. And, and uh, I can't wait to release it on, for desktop users as well. It's going to be released in a few weeks, uh, maybe in August or mm-hmm. uh, for desktop. But it's already on, uh, on iOS. It looks, mm. it, looks, it looks quite sleek. Yeah. It's nice, and I'm always a fan of um, the like any device that will like um, help under help you understand what's actually happening to your signal. Um, you know, I think like some good examples in the past were um, I think maybe Fab Filter started it with the compressor, uh, and now that we have that view in live too, where you actually see your waveform moving, and then you see the gain reduction line come down, so you can really see what's happening where your volume's getting turned down. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah, I like it very much. The guys at Kailu Module uh, did a great job uh, making this look on the compressors mm-hmm. very useful. Yeah, yeah, little things like that that just. That's where I understand the visual. I think that's like um, a nice use of the, the uh, you know, processing power that it's going to take up compared mm, to maybe mm. like a nice reflective metal box with cool looking <laughs> knobs that the light changes in them when you turn. Yeah. Like those are nice, but um, <clears throat> as good as it could ever get, it's never going to be a real knob on a box. So I think maybe um, it might be, and then this is, I guess, you know, just personal opinion. I probably disagree with myself on <laughs> if I look around in my plugin collection, but I think uh, sometimes rather than getting the graphic right to look like something physical, to use it in a way to help communicate what's actually happening to the sound. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely do agree. Uh, I think uh, there is kind of a synesthesia that uh, we have to try to achieve, hmm. and that cannot be done with just a knob mimicking hardware stuff. Yeah, I think it's interesting you bring that up. Um, I was just grading assignments for my Berkeley online class. Um, which is always funny to assign a grade to some to art, <laughs> but uh, it's more about if you went through the process or not. But anyway, um, our assignment is to like make um, this a soundtrack to like a horror TV show opening. Um, the inspiration for that is um, the uh, show um, America American Horror Story. I'm trying to blank on the name of that show. I think it's American Horror Story. Really interesting opening sequence that's not really music (laughs) it's like just sound design creepy squishy noises um so we go over like using sampling for that but uh in that particular like kind of music writing where you're you're deliberately going for like a specific emotion like of fear creepy scary um 
it, the sound design gets very visual. You know, there's this like element of like, even though you're not seeing anything when you're listening to it, like it creates these images in your mind. And the more I do that project every semester, the more I really think that that's a good way to approach every kind of music, honestly, because I think we're going for emotional impact first and foremost, in, in, in a lot of cases. But um, to have like a visual with the sounds, I almost think of it like characters in your song. You know, um, I think that really helps bring things to life when you say, all right, this is the little mischievous melody that comes in here causing a little trouble, creating tension that we're ultimately gonna release. Or um, even like, as I'm looking at your background right now with the Northern <laughs> Lights, like you can almost score that with like a sound. I probably would use some phaser and flanger to help like create that movement that's happening with those lights. But mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. then and there in that kind of thinking, I, I think it really opens up like um, your choices sonically. So I'm, I'm enjoying that little aspect too of what you guys are doing. Like the, like the granulizer has those like uh, kind of like little laser lights going as you play around. And I, th I think that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, it's helpful also more than it. You got a bit of random. So you need to understand where those grains of sounds are coming because sometimes you just can't uh, trust your ears only when it goes like so intense and all. And it's a good, useful tool mm. to have a visual stuff to, to be hanging at. But still, you have to make music with your ears first. <laughs> yes, there's that too, of course. <laughs> we listen to it. Um, I think maybe I'm talking more imagination, visualizing, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> imagine, uh, uh, for instance, your, your latest album, I've been listening to the ambient one with the blue cover. I can't uh, remind. It's an uh, inner, inner voyage or um, what's... Oh, oh man, journey inward. <laughs> journey, I, I should know. Journey, journey inward. <laughs> okay, okay. I wasn't, I wasn't far. And for instance, it's a very good example in the of the mood it can create of the um, immediate, uh, like neuro and psychological effect it has on mm. a on the human brain because instantly you feel more at ease, you feel more calm, and all. And uh, it's a very good example of how music can achieve mental Im images or, or mood switches, but in the good sense of it. And uh, I think we kind of look at music as, I mean, in this time, uh, in this time period, people tend to look at music as entertaining or like a way to spend time or like a fashion. But uh, I think there is way more to it. I think that music um, has an impact that is way more important that we can imagine and that we can, uh, that we are able to think of. And uh, it's also more in interesting to look at music, especially when you when you look at uh, older civilizations, for instance, uh, mm. already at that time, they had also uh, plenty of musical stuff, which was not only musical, but was also linked to a way of living, which was way more important than, than um, we think of it already today. People think that music sometimes is just like illustration or something to make something look or sound better but it's there is something more to it definitely mm. that is kind of a mystery yeah yeah you're right i mean it's been used for so long for inspiring emotions and bringing people together and you got me even thinking of like um like wartime even just like the drumming you know i think when i did that collection of songs um i was very tuned into the purpose of the music. Like it was music to fall asleep to, to meditate to, to do yoga. To. It was meant for that kind of purpose. 
So it made it very easy to kind of know what was appropriate. I knew an electric guitar solo with the wah wah pedal wasn't going to be in there right off the bat. <laughs> there was no no chance that would fit in there. But the sounds for the emotional stuff and for the picture of it. Um, and one thing I used was um, field recordings of nature and rain sometimes, and just even. Um, we were in a, my friend and I were in a forest, Markham Forest in Portland, Oregon, um, in, in, the U, in the Northwest US. And the, just the sound of the forest was really interesting. And I used that in, in the track called Markham for that reason. And it was just a, a nice, fun way to do it where this music has a purpose. It's for this. Mm. not even so much for like my artistic expression or my own creative output. It was just like, I want something for this job. And uh, mm. I learned a lot. I, I'd learned a lot actually doing a, a collection of songs for um, teachers and parents to use for kids with um, autism. And yes, it, yes. Uh, I've, I've had a listen to it. Oh, it yeah. made me think of, <laughs> of Matt Ward. You know, um, Matt Ward, it's a folk singer, an American folk, like yeah. M. Ward or... Oh, M. Ward. You would love it. M. Ward, yeah. M. Ward, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah it may, it remind me of, you know, that folky way of playing and singing. <laughs> I, I loved it, uh, <laughs> even though I'm not the main target of uh, yeah. this music. Yeah, that was a really fun project because it was... We needed these catchy songs to teach proper social behavior. It was called social story songs, and um, in in um, like those classroom settings, uh, a lot of times social stories are used to just teach you, teach the students like appropriate behavior. And a lot of times, um, that population struggles with that. Like, what's the appropriate way to behave in these situations? So. To just do it for like with that purpose, we knew they had to be catchy. They had, they were going to be mostly for kids, young people, and teachers and parents. So obviously, that took away a lot of like, you know, just took choices off the plate that we know we're not going to go too mm. nuts with this. The song structures are going to make sense and be somewhat predictable. But having that set, that clear intention, just made the songs like easy to do not you know it wasn't it's never easy but it just took away a lot of considerations and we weren't worried about our our artistic expression again because that wasn't the point of it mm. and we were just able mm. to use what we knew about music and songwriting to accomplish the goal it was a lot of fun mm. Mm. Uh, very interesting what you say because yeah you can make music without setting an intention first but and just like flow with it, which is also great feeling. I, I love it. But sometimes the, in the creative process, you've, you've got two main routes in a way. You can either try to express something which is related to yourself, to your ego, which is not a bad thing. I think it's a great thing on the contrary. If you can express your own emotions, then those emotions will, you know, talk to other, you know, human beings and all that. But there might be also another, there also another way, which is not the contrary, it's just different, where you set an intention and you go beyond your own emotional and personal needs to achieve a goal that is exterior uh, mm -hmm. to yourself. And then the music will sound differently in mm -hmm. a way. I don't know if you, if, you, if you see what I mean, but it's very interesting in every work of art to see if the artist try to reach something very personal or on the contrary, uh, try to tend to something that is more universal. Hmm. Maybe both can meet, but hmm. I think it's two ways of seeing things. Uh, in the creative process, uh, I like to think uh, of it like this. Hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting when the extremely personal, like more ego thing you mentioned, when that does resonate on a larger scale, because you can talk 
mm. you're writing lyrics about something so specific that only happened to you and but it captures something um, i've actually always been kind of fascinated um with the way country music does that um yeah i, I was have, thinking of will Dam, for instance you know Will Aldam is a great example. Uh, he started with his band Palace Music mm -hmm. and then did all of these albums that are kind of very personal. And there is something transcending about it because in the end it becomes universal. I don't know how it does it, <laughs> but it's it's very personal uh, at, uh, at first. Mm. Yeah, um, and it's not really the kind of music I listen to at all, but... I, I really appreciate how they can get so specific, especially in the verses. The verses are like so specific. It's like uh, just down to like the every detail, but then the chorus comes in with that like universal thing that connects it all. And um, I've enjoyed that um, in my own writing lately, like to pay attention to that where the, Sometimes, I, I've, and I've, I always think to this one uh, Bruce Springsteen song off of um, Nebraska, which I think is just like such a great record. He did it, I believe, on a, a cassette four or, or eight track recorder. And they tried to do it in the studio, but it wasn't as good as what he made in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, so they stuck with that. But he's got like the song, I think, um, I don't even remember which one it is, but... Uh, he talks about his his like sisters eating an ice cream cone and his his mom is like playing with her wedding ring and it's just um it's, it's like such a specific moment but you get what he's saying you know she's nervous so she's like he doesn't tell you she's nervous he she she's just playing with the ring and the sister with the ice cream cone kind of like unaware of what's going on you know happy of the go lucky kid and so much of it you have to like color in yourself but it's it's amazing like how when you get that specific you would think it would almost like ruin it for other people but it actually makes it more relatable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then more universal in mm -hmm. a way yeah mm -hmm. you know i think um i see this a lot and um you know like a entrepreneur like uh language and talk where they say, you know, make the thing that you always wanted, <laughs> you know, uh, like make, make it for yourself in a way, because there's so many other people that are probably just like you. And, you know, I found that in doing like music production tutorials and I could get really specific about something that most people aren't that into, but the people that are looking for that kind of thing are just like, yes, that's it, you know? And, Sometimes the more true to, you, true to yourself and forget about everyone, the more it actually connects to everyone in some weird way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a big dimension of sincerity, I think. If you are sincere, uh, it will be felt. And this very sincerity is something that many are looking for, especially nowadays. Mm. Yeah, right. Especially nowadays, we're looking for <laughs> that connection and sincerity where everything is often so polished and produced and fixed up. <laughs> so um, I, let's see. Uh, th I mean, there's so many cool things you guys have. Are, how is the process of getting things from iOS to Mac OS, for instance? Um, and, and I should actually ask you too, are you guys on Windows as well? With the, yeah, yeah, the, we are. Like, yeah, absolutely, we are on Windows as well. Uh, we we had to, and uh, it's a very interesting question because um, recently Apple has tried to push forward a kind of universal approach to uh, right. app making, and that's exactly so that, what I'm, I'm curious about. Like, because absolutely, mm -hmm. the idea is hope. I think that they're going for. They don't really tell you, but it looks like they kind of want your stuff that works on your iPad to work on your desktop. I'm just absolutely. curious if you're seeing that. If that's the push. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we've been looking into that very closely because uh, we have quite a few apps, and at at 
at first when I saw that Apple was like having a one single operating system that would work across all the devices, so iPhone, iPad, but also Mac, and this tends to be more and more uh, true, I thought what a wonderful opportunity we can make our apps di directly Mac compatible and that will be it and uh, very easy to port our app to Mac. But sadly, <laughs> uh, we are in a niche uh, software, uh, you know, uh, we do niche software and for that Apple hasn't definitely worked on that yet. So you have to make some adaptations when you port an iOS app to Mac. And sadly, uh, you cannot make uh, AUV3. So AUV3 is a iOS format for plugins straight to Mac. You have to make some work first. So technically, basically what we do on the Bliss apps is that we put all of our work first in the DSP processing, so the digital signal processing, which is made with C++. C++ is, is a language that is told to be very close to the machine, so very CPU efficient. You can, it is made for real-time processing, so we put a, lots of energy into making great DSP, great sounding DSP. And then after that, we think of the interface. And making the interface on iOS is not the same as making an interface that can also work on desktop computers. So on the iOS apps, we use Swift, which is the main Apple uh, you know, language for iPads and all. It could also be done for macOS, but we've made another choice, which is to be working with something called Juice, Juice is uh, owned by the Holly company as well. And they've made a, a software development kit that made uh, possible to port the C++ DSP you know, modules on other devices such as Mac, Windows. So we do native development on iOS apps. We keep it native regarding the DSP processing, but we also use Juice for the interface. Hmm. And then once we've been working on the interface for the desktop, then it becomes Windows and Mac compatible. But yet we have more issues with Windows than we have uh, with Mac, I must admit. Hmm. Uh, yeah, there, are, there are more like difficulties with Windows computers, but these dif differences between Mac and Windows tend to, to be, uh, you know, uh, less, uh, less of a problem. Windows is getting better. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that because there's just so many different computers running Windows and then Mac is a much more limited, there's just fewer devices, you know, you got your MacBook Pro, your iMac. Absolutely, your, absolutely. Yeah. This is why we do not make any apps for Android device, for instance, right. it would be such a mess. You have to beta test every single version of every single phone that runs. Yeah. Well, uh, 10,000 phones and uh, tablets, it's not uh, imaginable. Uh, iOS, I guess. There are like thousands. Yeah, iOS, if it works on a iPhone 5, it works on a, on an iPhone 12. It's right. almost, hmm. almost true. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's something to think about, huh? <laughs> mm. uh, okay. Yeah, and also you've got uh, audio latency to, to take into account. Mm. And yes, it's wonderful to be making apps, especially for iOS, iPad. It's uh, very new, very stable, very efficient. Um, like, for instance, um, I've got an iPad third gen, and I can work with a, a buffer of 64. So 64 is close to real time. Mm. It's uh, it's amazing how uh, how it works well uh, on those devices. At macOS also is is fine. You, you can definitely achieve really really low latencies with great stability as well. Mm. Oh, that's good. Yeah, um, that's one day, right? We won't even have to think about that too much. Less and less, I mm. gotta admit. Um, I 
adjust the buffer size when I'm working way less often than I used to. You know, back in the old days, it was like every time I do anything, I have to switch something so that I can, my mm, computer can mm. handle it. But it is nice that we're getting that. <laughs> um, let me, I was just going to ask you something about, uh, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. So we're, when we were talking about like the delay, how you can have the feedback go past 100%. There's there's still a limit, right? I think maybe it was, is it like one thirty or I, I I might have to double check what the actual number is. Yeah, uh, hundred twenty or hundred thirty, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, there's there's a choice for you to decide. All right, that's enough feedback for these people, right? I'm gonna get too out of control. Um. Have you ever experimented or, or do you find it interesting or would it even be like a consideration to like kind of like almost make those limitations like settings in the devices that users can play? Like how do you decide what limitation to put on things that um, keeps... How and why do you decide, I guess, is what I'm, I'm trying to get at. Like what where you stop things? Yeah, very good question. It's a very good question. Well, the limit is very clear and easy. Mm. It's when we think it's not musical anymore. Okay. So there's like a, a, bit, uh, a limitation. A bit crusher. A bit crusher is a very good example because there is a limit below which it doesn't sound anymore. It's not music anymore. And uh, you can still put a bit crush to zero and then you have no sound going through, but a bit crusher has to be tweaked so that it can sound more musical or have a wider range of musicality. So it's, so it's the same thing for everything. I mean, by usage, by feeling, we will try to, to reach the limits, but we hate uh, we definitely hate to make, you know, uh, features that are just technical. We have plenty of users that say, okay, uh, why uh, don't you put like some more LFOs, more modulation destinations and all, yeah, yeah, okay. It's always good to have more LFOs and modulation destination, but there is always a stage where it gets like pure, you know, geek stuff and uh, brain stuff when you have to keep it musical. So the very limit, I think, is musicality. And we always try to achieve that musicality, even if it's a wide you know, a range of possibilities. But it still has to like feel musical uh, rather than just technical. Hmm. Yeah, there's definitely some examples in music history where there were like parameters you can adjust beyond what anyone would think you would want. And that like, I'm thinking maybe of like auto tune, for instance, um, uh, you know, the creators didn't think you'd ever want it to be at zero, you know, so that the note changes are instant, but then that became a sound and people were using it. And like, you know, when you read about them, the people that created, they're like, I never thought you'd ever want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or probably even a delay feedback over 100%, you know, when you start getting the noise. I could imagine uh, developers saying like, oh, this, this is just out of control. No one would want this to happen. Yet again, uh, you, know, you know, you get adventurous producers and sound designers that say, no, this is where the action is. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Ultimately, uh, the musicians are the ones that should put a limit to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can understand it for a couple of reasons. For one, um, you know, you don't want people breaking things. <laughs> like, because I can only imagine the support tickets for that. But um, it does help focus the work. I mean, we were talking about that earlier and how that is useful yeah. to have that kind of like, hey, look, stick in here. You know, mm. work with this. Yeah. A good example is like uh, we are working on a FM synthesizer. So we've made a first synthesizer called the Bliss Alpha, which is polyphonic analog synthesizer, very 
Uh, I love I love it. You know, you can uh, stereo each oscillator and all. Uh, it's, you've got the pan and on the Omega FM synths. We, at the very beginning, put a filter on the high end because with FM synthesizers you can mm. go very very high uh, for the ears. It can be even damaging for your uh, ears. And so we've put we've put this limitation right. Uh, and put some filter, a filter in the end, just to make sure that you don't make bark all the dogs of the <laughs> of the neighborhood. <laughs> right. This is a good example, and it's still musical, but mm -hmm. not so technical because you don't need to reach above uh, twenty five thousand hertz. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's a good point because um, you can, yeah, think especially FM gets. Uh, it's a slippery slope, when, you know. When you yeah, start. it can get crazy. It can yeah. be quite crazy, but also very experimental, uh, very, very interesting. For instance, we've been working also on a preset generation, so the ability to press a dice button that will generate presets. Mm -hmm. On the first versions we've been working on, it wouldn't sound, or it would be like too random or unusable, but working on the rules, musical rules behind the pre preset generation, we've achieved quite an interesting random preset generator that still goes within a certain range that we cons consider as being still musical. Mm. Right, yeah. And that I like that feature a lot. I've seen that uh, on a few things here and there where there's like kind of the random generation. And there's, well, for instance, in live, even now, you have a random button on the macros. Uh, but they've, in kind of going with what you've said, there's also a feature where you can right click on a macro and say exclude from all this randomizing. So, like your volume control, for instance, you know, you might not want mm -hmm. that to go down the negative 39 dB <laughs> randomly and you won't hear anything. So, you can have that be excluded. And it's really nice to just see, hey, well, what'll happen? What'll happen? What'll happen? And I, I find it often gives me a nice starting point for something I wouldn't have tried to do deliberately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You, when you can get so surprised uh, and go and find some things that you wouldn't, fi wouldn't have found by yourself in yeah. the end. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so... It, it can be random, but it's like an intelligent random. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a invisible uh, random or visible or whatever. Yeah, yeah, just just edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll take like a a lot of testing, I guess, to figure out what needs to be <laughs> randomized and what needs to be left alone. Well, there are a few rules, for instance, if you've got a high pass and low pass filter, first rule is that they don't cross each other so that they, you don't get a, you know, a null, uh, hmm, uh, such yeah. things. Uh, if you just put random on everywhere, it, it will never work. But if there are a few rules, uh, and musical roles, you can achieve something that really, really gets interesting in sound design. Hmm. That's fun stuff. Yeah, that's cool. I, I look forward to that feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've got that also in another synthesizer, a sample-based synthesizer we are working on, and then uh, uh, which I hope uh, we will be releasing uh, this year. Hmm. Yes, that's exciting. So that's what's next, right? The some some new synthesizer action, and uh, I guess the continuing port of the iOS stuff to the Mac and the mm -hmm. Windows desktop. Yes, and Windows. Let's not forget them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There are quite a lot of uh, Windows users. I, I would say from the figures I have, that uh, it's almost half of the of the musicians out there. So may, an FL Studio maybe has something to do with it because for a long time, okay. FL Studio would work only on Windows uh, machines and it's a very interesting though as well. So mm. somehow maybe FL Studio did help people to, to switch to, to Windows. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I see a lot of a lot of the younger kids that I work with um, get into FL, and maybe that's why. But I think you know it's also popular with a lot of the musicians that they're listening to as well. So yeah, but I guess now uh, relatively re recently it came over to Mac, I believe. Yes, yes, it used to be Mac compatible, but not as stable as it should. And the twentieth, uh, so the latest version is hmm. is a great version. Uh, I think it's a very, very interesting uh, DAO, very different approach. I've made uh, some, it was my first DAO, for instance, when I, when I was a teenager, it was my first DAO. At that time, I wouldn't want to make trap music like every other kid now, <laughs> but uh, it was a fun, you know, sequencing approach of making music. And uh, when you haven't had the opportunity to, you, to try more linear doughs such as Cubase, for instance, it's very refreshing to have this kind of other approach to music making. And also the inbuilt, you know, the factory plugins are really, really good as well. Limiter, compressor, for instance, have great visualization. It's a very interesting approach. And it sounds, uh, it has a sound uh, that is that makes it quite distinctive. Hmm. Yeah, hey, you know, all these different tools will lead you to work in different ways. Mm, hmm. Absolutely. It leads you in a in another way. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre uh, always says that the tool is what influences you into mm. making such kind of music or, or other kind of music. Like, just like you make an ambient uh, album with an OP1. <laughs> mm -hmm. Incredible, incredible. Oh yeah, well, OP1 has inspired a lot of things because of the way it is. And I get mm -hmm. that even just to pick up a different guitar and you just play it a little differently. It feels different. You get inspired in other ways you wouldn't normally, you know, just, uh, I mean, even if I'm in a different place, if I'm not sitting here doing music, if I'm outside, say, or, you know, everything, um, you know, we're just all these weird, like all these weird conduits of energies and things. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Music is not purely intellectual. Yeah. Otherwise your music would still be the same, uh, mm. independently from your environment. But it's true that, uh, your, your music will sound differently, uh, and will be influenced by external stuff and uh, more stuff than we can that we are able to perceive mm, yeah that's true and i guess every time i go to make music i'm a little different than i was the last time <laughs> it's part of what's so fascinating about it can't quite figure it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it's it's kind of magic because uh it hasn't been uh, explained by science yet mm. Yeah. We, oh, completely. Yeah. Well, we have like, a, there's a lot of mathematics to it, a lot of physics to it, but there's, um, there's like those lights behind you. <laughs> there's <laughs> something kind of mystical and magical, spiritual, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it's, it's what keeps it fun. And it's yeah. really cool you're making some of the tools that help us make that and help inspire us in new and exciting ways. I got to tell you, I was having a lot of fun with the granulizer because you have this feature where you can route different audio tracks right into it. So it's, it's a, I guess it's an audio effect really, but you can pipe in audio from all different sources. So I had like drums, a pad and some noises going in there and it's just pumping out all this like magic <laughs> on the other end mm -hmm. yeah 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 yeah. We, we are very proud of this feature and this has been inspired by ios limitations hmm. for instance quite recently on ios thanks to uh, jonathan's uh, main developer of uh, what's called aum or home which is like a mixing table for ipad it's a brilliant host he has recently made this possibility to route uh, several tracks within a plugin. And it was an iOS feature that was very rare at, the, at that time. So when we made Granulizer, we implemented this, this feature along with it. And when we went to desktop, 
we realized that uh, there there were not uh, that much you know plugins that were uh, able to root in uh, plenty of different sources. So, for instance, the granulizer goes to up to four different sources, and uh, and this is why uh, it came out like this. And for instance, it's great that you are in Ableton because Ableton allows you to root like an infinite amount within the plugin. Whereas you can be limited to only two sources, which is already great, but only two input sources, input signals on uh, those such as uh, Logic or um, Bitwig, for instance. Hmm. Yeah, it opens up a lot of possibilities for sound design and just creative fun. And there's definitely a magical element to it where you kind of never really sure what you're going to get. And I think that's always fun. Mm. Very well, random. Yeah, it is. And it's uh, sometimes that's good. You know, it's great to know everything and understand technically what's happening. And then there's sometimes a little sprinkle of the unexpected, which I think often is what excites me a lot of times. You know, so I, I'm enjoying it. It's very cool stuff. Yeah, great. And listen, I'm really happy you took the time to sit down and talk and share some of this with us. Um, it's it's always fun for me to learn a little bit about what goes into the tools we use. You know, um, sometimes I think we just sort of take them for granted. Oh, here they are. It's just here. But there's there's so much that has to be considered that I don't think I know I don't always consider myself. Just the idea of well like where should we allow them to turn this knob to <laughs> where should we tell them now nah, this is for your own good you can you know, stop here so i appreciate you taking the time yeah yeah thank you very much uh, brian it was a real pleasure to to talk with you and share about uh, about our love for bliss uh, mm. my love for bliss but uh, i speak also in the name of uh, of uh, these three people company and uh, it's all about passion and uh, this is why I was really happy to to be uh, with you today. Hmm. Yeah, I'm very happy to share in that excitement. So we should tell people to go to bleas.com. It's B-L-E-A-S-S dot com. You, you'll see everything there. You got all the iOS stuff linked to it and then the desktop stuff as well. So uh, anywhere else you, you want to send people? Well, uh, the main hub is bliss.com. We also uh, distribute over our plugin boutique, mm -hmm. but you'll get you you'll get uh, all of our apps available from the Bliss website and uh, more uh, more plugins, effect plugins, but uh, as well synthesizers are going to be released in the coming months uh, and more tutorials as well. So plenty of of content and. Uh, and uh, also, maybe I should mention that we try to offer, you know, uh, prices that we consider as being reasonable, mm. because some manufacturers tend to create kind of an illusion where they sell plugins like for hundreds and hundreds of bucks, and then suddenly make a very huge discount, like ninety percent discount, and uh, we rather have like a a normal price and just make smaller discounts perhaps, but I think that 15 bucks for a reverb plugin is more, you know, reasonable than trying to sell just a few for hundreds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you see what I mean. Oh, absolutely. And I know everyone appreciates that because, you know, we're all starving artist on some level right <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's it's always good to to um save a little and get something of quality so very good stuff so check out bleas.com again b-l-e-a-s-s.com um and yeah if you're in the music production club within the next uh seven to ten days i guess it is from the release yeah of this ten show. days ten days so i think that's gonna be Something like, I'll have it for sure in the show notes, but that's going to be something like July 9th to the 19th. So 
get on that. Get the uh, delay for free and start turning that feedback knob past 100% and see what fun stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for taking the time. Really good yes, time. Yes, thank you, Brian. Uh, cheers. Cheers. And thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great day.